Hello, and welcome to this edition of the Pyramid Insight Hour. Uh, as you know, I do a presentation a month, and I alternate these presentations. And before we get into today's presentation, just simply want to make sure and give a thank you to those folks who are working hard to enable the rest of us to be safe and to have our needs met during the pandemic and in the ongoing waves of issues as the pandemic unfolds. So thank you for helping us uh, do the things that we do and to be safe and secure while we're at it. You may know that I've been in this industry for a very long time. I've been writing and researching and publishing what I hope are pragmatic insights to help individuals grow and develop in their work. Um, this certainly is um, an important a part of the work that I do in sharing the insight and knowledge, whether it's through written publications or through these um, various presentations that I'm doing where I'm trying to offer some of the insights I've gained over my career. If you'll send me your <clears throat> shipping address, I'm happily to, to send you a complimentary copy of one of my very, very pragmatic booklets on emotions and health or uh, emotions and leadership, and um, hopefully you'll uh, utilize it and get back to me and let me know how it was useful to you. It contains information about emotions and worksheets uh, that individuals can utilize to help enhance their understanding of their emotions and how those emotions play out. I alternate the EQ topics with talent topical titles. Uh, you see here for the rest of the year, the topics that I'm going to cover in uh, July, October, and December, where I'm going to be looking at learning experiences and the questioning that promotes growth, as well as the things we need to do to boost uh, our brain agility. And on those other months, I'm doing the economic series. Uh, today, obviously, lean on me. And then in August and October, uh, we'll take a look at stress hardiness and understanding, processing, and utilizing emotions in October. You may know the soulful song by Bill Withers, uh, Lean On Me. It's a song that calls out to us to realize that each and every one of us need one another. And sometimes we need to lean on one another. And one of the most common ways in which we lean is um, by being empathetic, by listening, responding in ways that communicate our highest regard and care for another person. And it's the kind of thing where um, we know when a, a, a good empathetic response has happened, uh, that mutual understanding has occurred and perhaps deeper insight into the situation has occurred. So today we're gonna to take a look at active empathy we're going to look at some of the debates on empathy, what empathy may be, what are some downsides of empathy. We want to look at how to enhance it and, in fact, how it gets misunderstood, as well as what are the things we might do to enhance our empathetic responses. So as we come into this topic and in all the EQ topics, uh, I would tell you that it's my view that these are very complex issues. Um, complicated issues or complicated problem solving, if you will, as the capacity for a linear measurable um, understanding in which we can get to uh, a conclusion that's definitive. But in complex situations, it's very dynamic, it's unfolding, and we find ourselves in what we refer to as open systems where interdependent information or factors come into play and no less true here when we think about how powerful empathy is and how the empathetic response reveals new information, often in a situation that can be quite helpful. <clears throat> but before we get into empathy, I wanna invite you to go backstage with me for a little bit to think about emotional intelligence. And um, if you will, uh, the, the kinds of things I want to do backstage or think about the mechanics of emotional intelligence. What are the key levers? Um, what are the things we need to reflect on in the emotional intelligent considerations? And hopefully 
um, this backstage look at EQ will be helpful to you. I'm pretty much uh, confident that if we were to look at the literally thousands of research articles and books on emotional intelligence, we'd find that there are several um, layers. And one thing that is true of all of them is the power and importance of emotional literacy, the ability to name an emotion and understand what that emotion is all about. Um, there is clearly a consensus um, bubbling up in this more experimental community on eight capabilities of emotional intelligence. There are lots of folks who think that looking at personality patterns is sufficient to really understand the, the nature of emotional intelligence. And at the end of the day, um, the question is, what are the sorts of behaviors which show up in cognition as well as expressions that make up the nature of emotional intelligence or whatever dimension of it that we might want to look at. There's an additional component which has to do with the, the kind of meaning making system individuals are operating from. And Bob Kagan has given us a, a way of understanding um, this sort of constructive meaning making that people go through the rule referent individual is looking for an EQ SOP. What are the standard operating procedures? Give me the five items on the checklist to become more empathetic in regard to our topic today. Um, the, the social referent individuals uh, want to understand what other people understand about empathy and what that looks like. Self-referent folk um, base their reactions from a position of personal sort of values and personal experience and systems referent individuals really want to understand the empathetic response and the dimensions of empathy and the polarities around empathy and what's useful when. So as we go through this, we want to acknowledge that emotional intelligence is complex and it largely um, the richness of our EQ related understanding and response is tied to the ways in which we typically make meaning from our experiences. There are some rules of emotions that I, I really would invite you to consider. Um, I actually knew my Angelou. She was a visiting professor of mine at Wake Forest. And years later, when I was president of an international association, I had her do a keynote. And I talked to her about this quote that she that's applied to her, <clears throat> in which, as lots of people will uh, quickly quote her that, uh, you know, people will forget what you said or what you did, but never how you quote made them feel. And what I suggested to her and I suggest to you is there's nobody who makes you feel anything. You have feelings and you have reactions based on what people do. Those feelings and reactions are important to understand and are indicators of your own psychology. You wanna make sure you have a sense of what that's all about for oneself rather than give up personal power to what someone else does. But when you have a a feeling or emotional reaction to what someone's doing or what someone has said, it's useful to pause and think through what your emotional reactions are about and what could be prompting those reactions can lead to some significant insight um, as, you, as you reflect on the emotions and what they may mean for you. Emotional literacy means identifying the emotion and understanding the meaning in the emotion. And there, therein is uh, the bucket of gold, is making sure we are decoding the emotions that we are having and what we see others having. That becomes quite important in order for us to make a constructive reaction or constructive response. Um, I often say emotions really is our first language. And by virtue of the complexity of our mind, we've sometime, we have forgotten what the language is, what the language is telling us. Fear usually is, is a language of perceived danger. 
or threat. Anger typically is the message of violation of some form, uh, a barrier of some form that's gotten into um, one's way as you're trying to achieve a certain goal or objective. But what we know is, is that each of the emotions carry with them important meaning. So imagine if you're working with an individual and you sense they're embarrassed and you understand that that typically means they believe they failed at something or they have been exposed in a way they didn't want to be exposed. And so giving a thoughtful response to that embarrassment <clears throat> could come in any number of forms. Likewise, when someone uh, is angry, <clears throat> acknowledging the anger and, and inviting the person to share where they feel they have been wronged in some way um, is a way to move the conversation forward. Now, we know that with emotional intelligence and those who study the capabilities, we know it involves body language and paying attention to context being attuned to one's own body sensations and what one's feeling and how emotions blend together. We also know that acting on emotions involves analyzing them and aligning what action we want to take if we do it thoughtfully um, to be able to classify those emotions to, to know that's what we're responding to and to look for the constructive outcomes becomes really important. Now, if we were able today, I'd invite you and in, in your own reflective space, think about the EQ related behaviors that you're working on and especially those that you're working on related to empathy. It, it's my hunch that the bridge to deeper empathy is tied to the richness of our emotional intelligence and building and enriching our emotional intelligence will have the consequence of enriching um, the degrees of empathy that we can, in fact, provide. I would suggest to you that when we ask the question about the nature of empathetic responses, what, what is it that people feel or the concepts associated with empathy, we'll often see terms like um, compassion and sensitivity sometimes sympathy, um, the notion of being hopeful in our messaging with other people and providing assistance are all associated with the nature of empathy. And you might ask yourself, what's the most empathetic thing you've ever seen a leader do? I often share stories of my observations of Alan Mulally, who, while he was at Ford, was one of the most extraordinarily empathetic executives I've ever observed, where he was careful and thoughtful and optimistic in his interactions with each and every person, wherever they were in, in the organization. He always showed a positive regard uh, to those who, who might even be complaining about something within the company, and he listened intently and reflected on that and shared back his message of having heard and ask a question for deeper understanding. Now, just recently, in fact, May of this year in the New York Times around the issues in with Israel and the Gaza Strip, there was an article in the New York Times uh, that said a bit more empathy, a call for a bit more empathy. And if you read the piece, um, it's the assumption that empathy will lead to action. In fact, um, the general definition of empathy is that it's the ability to sense other people's emotions and the ability to imagine what others might be feeling or thinking and to understand and perhaps share the, those feelings. In other words, you're, you're having the feeling they're having. Notice that says nothing about taking action. Yet, whenever people put out the claim, we need to be more empathetic it tends to imply that there's some kind of action we need to take such that knowing exactly how you feel is one piece of empathy, not necessarily the whole story of empathy. 
some researchers and this particular one out of the healthcare field pointed out that it's critical in interpersonal and social roles. And notice um, the author's declaration that it promotes pro-social behavior. In other words, when we are empathetic and we perceive the emotions of others, um, we're more likely to respond in ways that are more constructive. Another researcher says, well, you know, in neurobiology, we know that um, empathy has to do with the inner imitation of the actions of others in the person who's making the observation. But notice again here in this research piece, in this summary, no presumed action is implied. And yet, in yet another research article, um, it's noted that uh, the feeling of the emotional states of others results in compassionate behavior. Empathy requires cognitive, emotional, behavioral, and moral capacities to understand and respond to the suffering of, of others. So my point is, is that when we start reading about researchers and empathy, we get uh, bio neurological definitions that tell us that something significant is happening on the brain, but that's not necessarily going to lead to some sort of behavior. And others who feel that a necessary part of empathy is what we do to demonstrate our understanding in some compassionate way. In a book by two researchers who really developed the social determinants of health uh, frameworks, um, they, they make a point of saying in their most recent book that empathy is key to survival, that it's only when we're empathetic that we're able to bridge the differences and we're able to protect those who are more vulnerable, which again implies that with empathy, there's something we're going to do. When Margaret Mead was asked the question of when she thought civilization started, she said, well, you know, when, when archeologists found the skeletal remains of an individual who had healed broken bones, that must be the point at which civilization starts, she said, because empathy is required for a social group to care for an injured group member in order for the injured party to survive and heal. This, she says, is when civilization began. Those who study empathy from a neuroscience perspective um, are writing and, and debating whether or not empathy is a key part of morality. Uh, the dimensions of empathy and how empathy may play out and its role in morality is by no means a settled uh, phenomenon. If we look at some of the interdisciplinary debates on empathy, we hear things like, well, it's, it's a perception action model that, that's really the best way to understand empathy. In other words, you perceive the emotions and the needs of others and you act on those in some particular way. You have an internal processing which leads to some external effort to diminish the distress of others uh, around you. And uh, if you go looking in the research, you'll find that now empathy is talked about as cognitive, emotional, and compassionate, meaning cognitive where you you really take the perspective of understanding the other person's situation. You're, you're in their shoes, if you will. Emotional, that you literally experience the emotions of the other person. And compassionate in that you, you experience the other person's pain and you take action to take help. So some researchers have kind of settled uh, on these three facets of emotion giving credibility to all three and suggesting that it's helpful to understand what kind of empathy may be uh, that we're talking about. If you go research, you'll find all kinds of uh, 
continua on empathy, um, images around neural pathways and what shows up when we're being empathetic, um, how empathy uh, may in fact be seen in levels of intensity. So the fact is empathy is a topic of much concern and the nature of and who is empathetic is further uh, an area of concern. You'll find that, that some folks who talk about empaths will identify empaths depending on the object of their empathy um, with really only one having to do with other human beings, the emotional empath. But that's another way of thinking about the power of empathy and who is being empathetic about what. We know that in leadership development, we talk about empathy as being an important part of being an effective leader. And certainly as our character says here, well, empathy, I, I could see how that could be useful. Well, how could it be useful? Well, in the Harvard Business Review in 2016, they published an article in which they created what was called the Global Empathy Index and took a look at which companies were performing well and how they were performing. And in fact, um, we see that according to this article, uh, those companies with the highest global empathy index outperformed those uh, with lower uh, levels of empathy. In a journal of cross-cultural psychology, um, they report a significant correlation between empathy and the value of collectivism within a, a group or a culture. And that there was a relationship between being conscientious and, and having high self-esteem with empathy. That implying that those of us who <clears throat> have an empathetic awareness will act on that and do so with confidence as we move forward. Recently, APA has published a variety of research articles that suggest that there's been a decline in empathy and there's been a rise in narcissism, which we might say, we see that play out on the public stage in a whole uh, variety of ways. And another article, um, a researcher reported that, well, human beings are avoiding empathy these days simply because it takes too much mental effort. It's too emotionally draining to invest in empathy very much because it takes too much effort. There's some folks who are saying, you know, putting yourself in another person's shoes um, may not be particularly healthy to do. In fact, you may be somewhat delusional if you think you really understand what another person is experiencing or seeing because you're not in their skin. Of late, <clears throat> there have been research reports that indicate that there's been an ongoing drop in measures of empathy among university students. Uh, this report, though it summarizes all the way to 2009, has continued to drop as the years have gone by. And yet, if we look at research, uh, Google searches for the word empathy or empathetic skills using just one country, Canada, has been a steady increase. So if empathy is in fact declining, um, there is certainly an increase in the interest in the nature of empathy and what does it mean and what does it look like? There are also more objections to being empathetic. Uh, leaders are report that if I'm empathetic, I'll be seen as weak or it takes too much time and we don't have time to invest in empathetic conversations. The most common is if I am empathetic, people will misinterpret that as an endorsement for their point of view and I don't want that to happen. Other research articles <clears throat> also in the Harvard Business Review say, well, you know, there are limits. It's exhausting. And if we do more of it at work, we have less sympathetic energy at home and it erodes ethics. So the use of empathy is by no means a given as an important part of our management and leadership roles. <clears throat> 
it's been reported that yes, there's a dark side of empathy. <clears throat> Sometimes we can find ourselves by mirroring the empathetic energy, uh, the emotional energies of others, we find ourselves uh, being depleted um, and that in fact, we lose motivation and energy uh, while being empathetic. It makes us sad, it can be dangerous, it could kill relationships, it tires us out, it can even make us angry because we've taken on the emotional energy, the emotional anger of another person. Um, and that clouds our judgment as we know anger does. In psychology today, the report was that it is possible to be so swamped by feelings and negative states that it is not healthy. It impairs our well-being. So <clears throat> what do we make of the empathy deficit? What do we make of the complexity of empathy? When and how it should be used? What do we do with the nature of empathy and how do we understand it? Becomes a really important question for any of us who are coaches or leaders in organizations. And I'm gonna to suggest to you that <clears throat> the, the best way to think about empathy is really to think about empathy on a continuum between empathizing and objectifying. Now, when I say objectifying, I don't mean uh, being disinterested in another person or their situation. I mean by that, um, standing apart from it, recognizing its dimensions and aspects. And I'm suggesting that when we feel we're in a partnership with other people and it's interdependent, the objectifying energy we bring to a situation can be constructive and clarifying. Likewise, empathizing can be helpful and affirming. When they're dependent, when we're not in partnership, in fact, empathizing can be manipulative uh, and experienced as a conflation of motives, as well as objectifying, demeaning, and disempowering. So I'm going to suggest that the answer to the various conundrums on empathy is really recognizing that empathy is on a continuum of responses that we need to manage in terms of understanding what's going on within ourselves and others. And that if we really want to foster partnership, we want to build an interdependency with one another so that I lean on you and you lean on me and that we trust uh, one is going to, uh, when necessary, stand back and reflect and provide as a much objective perspective as possible. And when some situations require to be helpful and affirming. It is the case that as we look at empathy as a complex matter, we see that in a variety of, in fact, this just came up in the Financial Times, where the person indicated that the goal is to have empathy and a sense of critical detachment, which I believe is that empathizing, objectifying dimension that I was referring to just a moment ago. So what is the proper role of empathy? Well, it is, as I think I've suggested, and as many of you uh, would suggest if you um, were to respond to the prompt, that it is important to have other people feel affirmed and understood and important that they walk away with a clarity of um, having had that understanding doesn't necessarily mean that there's permission for or uh, a forgiving of a circumstance, but that it needs to be worked through in a very thoughtful, systematic way. We know that active empathy has a variety of dimensions to it. It's identifying emotion and knowing how to respectfully diffuse emotions in a situation so that in fact, people um, can move into a more problem solving oriented space. We know that essentially related to empathy are uh, 
key aspects of how we take perspective, how we use our interpersonal skills, how effective we are at listening generously, and our overall social awareness in a circumstance impacts the quality of the empathy and the empathetic response that we might in fact give. Here's the thing, <clears throat> we know that being active and demonstrative with others means in an empathetic, if you will, the empathy we're communicating communicates that we are, we see the person and their issue is significant. We see the person uh, and trust that they are capable of working um, through the situation that they may be in, that they've leaned on you about, and that you're willing to spend time and energy and see them as worthwhile because we know people are wired differently. They need to feel significant, competent, and worth. And we do that by listening, restating, reflecting, asking questions, acknowledging, making sure we're giving them our full attention and summarizing um, as needed when we are interacting with others. Now, you know that we have um, five libraries. Uh, we have a library for individual contributors, managers, a library for leaders, potentials, as well as teams. And I asked, uh, as I started analyzing our libraries, what is the way in which empathy shows up in our various roles and domains? And particularly the practices, the practices which give us the details of what's going on in a particular level of uh, development. And what I found was that when you start pulling on the role of empathy and the power of empathy, a lot of the competency, the uh, practices which in, in, in indicate various competencies um, are in fact activated and utilized. So just know that we see that the empathetic, uh, an understanding of empathy in a rich way, in a meaningful way, shows up across all levels of organizational life and will enhance the development of individuals. And uh, as you will find in the handout, there's some references that you might utilize to help you explore this topic in more detail. Well, I hope you'll join me again for some of my economic series. My goal is to raise some questions, to point to some research, to show you how the economics material connects in some ways to the work that we're doing to promote talent development. Um, and hopefully you'll find that instructive and useful. Please visit us at www.talentintelligent.com so that you can learn of our various programs, our previous recordings, which are accessible, um, and also you know, set up a free consultation should you want to learn more about what we're doing. Until next time, take care.